Hi everyone. We're talking about swimmer's ear in this lesson. So we're going to talk about what this condition is. We're also going to talk about a wide variety of risk factors. We're also going to discuss the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So what is swimmer's ear? Swimmer's ear is also known as otitis externa. So if we were to break that word down, otitis, ot refers to the ear, itis refers to inflammation, and externa means external. So it's inflammation of the external ear. And more specifically, it is inflammation of the external auditory canal. It can be due to infectious causes or non-infectious causes. It's more likely to be caused by an infection. And we're going to talk about the bacteria and fungi that cause infection later on in this lesson. What is the epidemiology of swimmer's ear? It is a very common condition. It's estimated to affect approximately 10% of individuals at some point in their life and it has the highest incidence in children aged 7 to 14 years old. And it has a higher prevalence in the summer and in tropical locales. And we're going to see why that is in the next slide when we talk about risk factors. Now let's talk about some of the risk factors of swimmer's ear. Not surprising, one of the risk factors is swimming. And that is actually one of the most common risk factors for getting swimmer's ear. Another risk factor is humidity. So this explains why Incidences of swimmer's ear are higher in tropical locales and during the summer. Trauma of the external auditory canal is also another risk factor for getting swimmer's ear. So you can think about if people are shoving things into their ear or using cotton swabs, anything that is causing trauma inside the ear can disrupt the external auditory canal environment. Ear devices are also similar in this respect, and you can think about earplugs, hearing aids, and earbuds. These can all cause moisture to build up in the ear. Skin conditions can also lead to swimmer's ear, and these include eczema and psoriasis. So if eczema affects the external auditory canal or psoriasis gets in there as well, this can also disrupt the environment inside the ear. Obstruction. So anything that is causing obstruction of the auditory canal can also lead to moisture and changes in the environment within the ear, increasing the risk of getting swimmer's ear. So you can think about earwax. So if there's lots and lots of earwax in there that is obstructing the auditory canal, that can cause problems if there's a foreign object, such as we can see in some kids who put things in their ears. This can increase the risk of swimmer's ear as well. Certain medical conditions can increase the risk of getting swimmer's ear. These medical conditions more specifically increase the risk of getting infections in general. So swimmer's ear is just one of those types of infections. And these medical conditions include diabetes and immunocompromise. So anything that leads to a suppressed immune system can increase the risk of infections like swimmer's ear. And we can also see this with radiation or chemotherapy as well. And any alterations in ear anatomy in general. So if you just happen to be born with a narrow ear canal, this can act as a sort of obstruction of the ear canal, which can, again, lead to increased moisture, changes in the environment within the ear, increasing the risk of getting an infection in the ear or in the external auditory canal. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology behind otitis externa or a swimmer's ear. So here is a diagram of ear anatomy. Here is the external auditory canal that leads into the ear and eventually stops at the tympanic membrane. This is the eardrum. So this is all considered the external ear. Past the tympanic membrane inside here is the middle ear. So an infection in this area would be a middle ear infection or otitis media. But we're talking about an infection in this area, the external auditory canal. And as I mentioned before, the causes of a swimmer's ear can be infectious or non-infectious. Most of the time it's going to be infectious causes. And most of the time, it's going to be bacteria that cause an infection in this area. So again, an infection in the external auditory canal. And some of the most common causative bacteria are Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas can cause infection in the external auditory canal. Fungi are also another cause of infection in this area. And the species we're going to see that cause infection in the external auditory canal include candida and aspergillus species of fungi. 
So how do they actually cause infection? Why does this happen? So the reason has to do with changes in the external auditory canal environment. The external auditory canal contains numerous cerumen producing glands. So cerumen is earwax and that cerumen or earwax acts as a protective barrier and provides acidity in that environment. So an environment with some acidity slows or prevents growth of microorganisms like bacteria and fungi. So we can see how if there's any changes or alterations to this protective barrier or in this acidity or changes in the pH, we can see that this can increase the risk of having growth of certain microorganisms like these bacteria and fungi we've talked about. So that is really how this all happens. pH alterations, so a lot from those risk factors we talked about before, like swimming, if you get water in your ear, that can change the pH in your ear as well. Any moisture in the ear, so if there's any occlusion, so obstruction, if there's things in your ear for extended periods of time like earbuds, earplugs, all of this has to do with changes in the environment in the external auditory canal. There's changes in the pH and this can lead to inflammation in the area. These changes can ultimately lead to epithelial damage. So the epithelial lining in the external auditory canal can be altered and damaged. This can lead to reduction in cerumen production. And as we've just mentioned, cerumen acts as a protective barrier. And this can ultimately lead to increased moisture and then for these reasons, we can see increased microorganism growth. We can also see other non-infectious causes doing something similar. If there's skin conditions like eczema or psoriasis that get into the external auditory canal, they can also lead to alterations in the pH. They can also cause inflammation. They can also lead to reduction in cerumen production. So they have a similar mechanism as well. But for the most part, again, it's infectious causes. And most commonly, it's bacteria that cause infection in this area. Now, before I get into the signs and symptoms of swimmer's ear, I want to talk about the differences in acuity of this condition. There's both acute and chronic swimmer's ear. So if we have swimmer's ear or otitis externa, if it's less than six weeks, it is considered acute. It's acute otitis externa. And most acute cases are acute diffuse otitis externa. There's also something known as acute localized otitis externa as well. And if the condition lasts for greater than three months, this is considered chronic or chronic otitis externa. And you can think of anything in between six weeks and three months. You may consider this subacute, but for the most part, acute otitis externa, less than six weeks. If it's been longer than three months, it's considered chronic otitis externa. Okay, now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of swimmer's ear. One of the most common symptoms of swimmer's ear is ear pain or otalgia. And this can be elicited by pulling on the pinna, so pulling on the ear flap, or palpating or pushing on the tragus. And this portion right here is the tragus. So if you were to push in on this, this can elicit pain. And the severity of the pain can vary. It can be anywhere from very mild to severe. Another common sign of swimmer's ear is discharge or debris. So here are some other images of increasing severity of swimmer's ear. So we can see in this image, there's some very minimal debris. In this area, there's more discharge. And in this image, there is significant discharge. And the discharge can be yellow or white or gray in coloration. And in some cases, it can start out as clear discharge, and then it can quickly become purulent or pus-like in appearance. Pruritus can also occur. So pruritus is an itching sensation. This is more likely to occur initially with an infection. So there can be some itching and then it can lead to some pain and discharge. These are by far the most common signs and symptoms of swimmer's ear. And this itching sensation can be more common in chronic otitis externa. So individuals who have chronic otitis externa may have more itching sensation, some debris and less or milder pain sensation. And we can also see issues with itching more often in automycosis. And automycosis is a fungal infection of the ear. So this is the term we use for a fungal infection. Sensation of ear pressure is another symptom that patients can often describe. So it feels like the ear is full or there's some pressure in the ear. And when looking in, external auditory canal becomes erythematous and edematous. Erythematous and edematous means that they are very reddened and swollen in appearance. So when you look in the external auditory canal, the external auditory canal looks red 
and it looks swollen. It looks like the external auditory canal has been narrowed. So this can be another important sign of swimmer's ear. What are some other symptoms of swimmer's ear? One of them is tinnitus or tinnitus. And this is a ringing of the ear. This doesn't happen in all patients, but some patients can describe this. Hearing loss can also occur. This may be due to the occlusion of the external auditory canal with so much debris and so much edema. In severe cases, we can see lymphadenopathy. So lymphadenopathy is swollen, tender lymph nodes in the area around the ear. Fever can also occur if in a severe case, and the lymphadenopathy and fever are more likely to indicate a systemic spread of the infection. And this leads to severity of otitis externa or swimmer's ear. In mild cases, there can be pruritus, so itching sensation, and mild edema, and maybe a mild discomfort as well. Moderate swimmer's ear, the external auditory canal is partially occluded with moderate pain or discomfort. And in severe swimmer's ear, the external auditory canal is completely occluded. The ear theme and edema are significant, completely occluding the external auditory canal. And there's oftentimes systemic symptoms like fever and lymphadenopathy. And we can also see malaise also in these severe cases. There's some other clinical presentations of swimmer's ear I haven't talked about, but I just want to briefly discuss here. One of them is known as eczematous otitis externa. This is dermatitis, so it's atopic dermatitis within the external auditory canal. In this type of otitis externa, we can see pruritus, so itching, scaling, and flaking, and oftentimes the discharge is more clear in appearance. There's also a very significant clinical presentation of swimmer's ear, and this is known as necrotizing otitis externa or malignant otitis externa. And oftentimes patients with this describe a deep pain, and it's often very severe in intensity. And this necrotizing otitis externa is more likely to occur in immunocompromised patients. So patients with suppressed immune systems, so you can think of patients with diabetes or older patients. And then I alluded to this before, automycosis is a fungal infection of the external ear. So we talked about fungi being causative organisms in swimmer's ear. And if it is known to be a fungus that is causing infection of the external ear, then we call this automycosis. So this is a fungal infection of the ear by fungi of the genera Candida and Aspergillus, as we mentioned before. Most symptoms are very similar with regards to what we talked about earlier on. But what I want you to pick up here is that there's usually a very smelly, malodorous discharge in automycosis. And diabetes and immunocompromised patients are more likely to have automycosis than other types of patients. Now let's talk about how swimmer's ear is diagnosed and treated. So diagnosis of swimmer's ear is often a clinical diagnosis. So based on history and risk factors and physical examination, the diagnosis is made, particularly with autoscopy. So using an otoscope. So clinician looks inside the external auditory canal, sees that reddened or ear thymidus and edematous external auditory canal with some debris or discharge. That is often what is needed for a clinical diagnosis. A culture of the discharge can be performed, especially if the patient is immunocompromised, to assess whether it is polymicrobial or if there's any particular bugs that are causing the swimmer's ear. Imaging is not required unless there is concern about a possible mastoiditis or an inflammation of the mastoid bone behind the ear, or if there's concern that this is necrotizing otitis externa. And once this has been diagnosed, how do clinicians treat it? So first, it's important to identify and eliminate the cause of swimmer's ears. So identify the risk factors we talked about before and eliminate them. If there's pain involved, pain management is also important. Debris removal is also important because of the treatment of topical eardrops. So topical eardrops are important treatment for swimmer's ear. Removing the debris out of the external auditory canal, you can imagine if you're removing it, it's allowing the topical eardrops to get to where they need to be. So they're not being stopped or blocked by debris. And for topical eardrops, some of them include acetic acid drops. So things that acidify the external auditory canal. Some include antibiotic eardrops. So some of the antibiotics that we can see in eardrops include polymyxin B or neomycin. Ciprofloxacin is also another antibiotic that can be found in these types of eardrops. And a lot of times there can be hydrocortisone in the eardrop as well. And a lot of times applying these topical eardrops 
can lead to a clinical resolution in most cases within 7 to 10 days. And for severe cases, a clinician may decide to admit and put a patient on IV antibiotics, especially for necrotizing otitis externa cases. So if you want to learn more about other infections, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.